Thank you, Pat. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, would you please turn with me to the book of Joshua? I'm going to be reading the whole chapter, so hang in there with me. Amen. Uh, Joshua chapter 3. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out from Shittim, and they came to the Jordan. He and all the people of Israel and lodged there before they passed over. At the end of the three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it, in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonderful, wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, and they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, here is how you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Gizzites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be cut off, flowing. And the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. So when the people set out from the tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people, and as soon as those bearing the Ark of the Covenant, as far as, uh, I'm sorry, had come to as far as Jordan, the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of the waters. Now Jordan overflows all the brinks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in the heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Zeratan, and those flowing down towards the sea of Arabah, the salt sea, were completely cut off, and the people passed over the opposite to Jericho. Now the priests bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firmly and dry in the midst of the Jordan. And all the people was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you, Joshua. Uh, love giving the word. It, it, we are passionate about the word, and we want to give it its place in, in our service. And so thank you, Joshua, for reading. Now, you know, the world has uh, really been degrading since Adam and Eve munched on the fruit in the Garden of Eden, right? I mean, we know that. But it seems like over the last couple of years that that, that pace has really picked up. The degradation of our world, it, it's, the, it, the pace has just really picked up. I mean, man, we, 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 we see the cultural wars that are happening all around us. And we used to sit on our couch and watch those on the screen on our TV or go to the movie theater and watch them on the, the movie theater and think, man, can you believe what TV is introducing uh, in, in these cultural wars and how it's affecting us? But now it's, it's moved from, uh, you know, the screen uh, into our uh, living room and into the school room, right? I mean, as the culture, the, 
the, the secular liberal culture continues to bombard us greatly with this cultural wars that's taking place. We have social wars that's taking place, man. I mean, you know, COVID is one of those issues that's just divided socially. It's divided people over what to do, how, how do we respond, how do we do this, and do we do this, do we do that? And you got half over here and half over here. And you got these social wars that are just like literally bombarding us. And then, man, you've got stuff like Ukraine being invaded by Russia and I mean, you just sit back and you're in, in, awe, in, in stunned, really. I mean, it's, it's like, uh, I don't know about you, but here's what I feel like. I feel like I'm watching a bully beat his wife and kids uh, from, my, from my, my window. I'm watching and I'm doing nothing. Now, I, I know it's, there's a lot more to it than that. I know that. I know that I don't, have, I don't have, pretend to have all the answers. There's so many things to it, but that's just how I feel. And I, somehow I think you probably feel the same way too. And, but here's what we've seen in this and this war, and this invasion, this Russian invasion, we've seen the tale of two leaders, right? I mean, you, you've seen two distinct different leaders. First, you've seen and been stunned. I think the world has been stunned by the arrogant, selfish, uh, unstable leadership of, of, of Vladimir Putin, which we've known as unstable for years. And, and we've seen that arrogance, that, unself, uh, that selfishness, that, that, that instability that, that he brings. On the other hand, we've been inspired by the Ukrainian president, uh, Vladimir Zelensky. Uh, we've been inspired by his selfless, heroic leadership. I mean, I haven't really seen anything like this in modern, uh, in modern history, where a leader of a, of the, of a country uh, is, re re rather than hiding in presidential bunkers somewhere, is fighting with his men. I mean, we, we don't see that in, in, in our world. And there's something about that that goes, wow. I mean, man, I, I, I respect that dude. I mean, you know, when, when, when you have uh, the U.S. that goes in and, and offers him, uh, offers to get him out of uh, Kiev, and he says, hey, look, I'm not looking for a ride. I'm looking for ammo. There's something about you that just says, you go, man. I mean, right? I mean, there's something about the guy when, when you know, he, he, he so believes in a government of the people, by the people, for the people, that he's, he's going all in with it. He's, he's committed to the point that he, he's told the world, it, when you look at, 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 at when, when our enemy sees us, they're going to look in our eyes. They're not going to, they're not going to see our backs. And, and, and I mean, like you find out the dude has, has, has it, he, he has overcome this week, escaped three assassination attempts. As, as we know that Russia has sent in like 400, two different groups of mercenaries to assassinate this guy. And, uh, and he told, told his people this week, uh, this might very well be the last time you see me alive, that I'm talking to you alive. It's like, he, 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 here, there's something that just endears you to that man, right? He's not a believer, but there's something that endears you in Jesus Christ. He's not a believer in Jesus. There's something that endears you to this man, right? Matter of fact, he's endearing himself to the world. I mean, that's the kind of leadership that we want to see in the world, and it, it's endearing. Well, why did I, why did I use that to, to, to talk about today? And I hope you're praying for Ukraine right? I hope you're praying daily, but that's not, uh, I didn't just want to praise uh, Vla Vladimir uh, Zelensky. I, 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 as I was writing the sermon this week, that was what kept coming to my mind because that's exactly what's happening in Joshua 3. God is elevating and raising up. He is, in, he is exalting Joshua's leadership. Joshua's a new leader, right? He's been, he's not new on the scene. He's been with Moses since they left uh, Egypt, since the Exodus, he's been Moses' aide. He's been Moses' assistant. He went with Moses upon the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. He, he's been with Moses. So he's not new uh, on the scene, but here's what he is. He, he, he is new in leadership. And God says, I'm going to exalt you. I'm going to endear you to the people. And that, that's what we see here. And here, here's where Joshua picks up. The people have been wandering for 40 years. They came out of Egyptian bondage. And they should have made a beeline straight from Egypt to the promised land. God promised to give them the land flowing with milk and honey. All the way back in Genesis 17, he made a covenant with Abraham and he promised to make him the father of many nations. He promised this land. And so when God makes a promise, it's, it's as good as done, right? Because God always keeps his promises. And these, these Israelites, they should have left Egypt and went straight to the promised land. But because of their distrust and rebellion, especially at Kadesh Barnea, where he sent the 12 spies, the spies come back, and two of them, Joshua, Caleb, we can do it. Three of them, like, no, we can't. It's too big. It's too mean. We can't overtake them. And they were outvoted. And because of their disbelief, because of their distrust of the rebellion, God said, you're going to wonder until this whole generation dies off. You're not going in. And then the next generation is where I'll start to do my work. Folks, listen, church, you don't ever want to be the generation that God says, I'm skipping you and I'll, I'll just deal with the next generation. 
You don't ever want to be that generation. And so that's what happened to Israel. They've been wandering 40 years. They all died off, just as God said. Now it's their children. It's the children of slaves, uh, and they're nomads, and they have now come after 40 years to the plains of Moab, uh, close to the Dead Sea, and they're on the banks of the Jordan River. And it's time, finally, after all these years, to take the land. It's time. This is the land that God promised, and it's right there. And they can see it, and it's time to take it, but it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be an easy task. I mean, they're going to have to face fierce warriors toe-to-toe. They're gonna have to go go, go toe-to-toe with these fierce Canaanite warriors and all these tribes collectively that are referred to as the Canaanites. They're gonna have to go toe-to-toe. And these were nomads. These were children of slaves. They weren't seasoned warriors. They're gonna have to go face-to-face, toe-to-toe with fierce warriors. They're gonna have to sack well-fortified cities. Uh, They're going to have to figure out how we go into this culture and don't become like this culture. They got all these things that's gonna be difficult. But before they can even fling an arrow or pull a sword, they've got to get across a raging river. And and, and it seems impossible. Now, if you've ever been to Israel with me, and uh, if you haven't, we're going to go back now that things are opening back up, and we're going to wait and see if if they stay open uh, so that we don't want to plan a trip and it closed down. Uh, We'll plan one soon. But if you've been with me, then you've seen the Jordan River. We baptized in the Jordan River. Every time I go, we baptize people in the Jordan River. And by the way, this took place in about the same area where Jesus was baptized in the Jordan, by the way. We baptized the river upriver uh, and uh, close to the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus was baptized more down close to uh, the Dead Sea. Uh, and, and so this took place where Jesus goes into the river when John's baptizing closely in that same area. And, and so the Jordan, when you see the Jordan, to be quite honest, you don't think it's that impressive. It's not an impressive uh, body of water by looking at it. It might be 100 feet wide in some areas, those of you who remember, it, it might be three foot deep to maybe eight to 10 foot deep in the, in the deepest part of the channel on some days. And so it's not that impressive. And you're thinking about how, how, how in the world, I, I don't understand when you say get across this raging river. Well, that wasn't the way it was in, in, during springtime or during uh, the, I'm sorry, during harvest time in, in the spring. Uh, that wasn't the way it was. It became a raging river. Because he, the Jordan River runs from Mount Hermon Mount Hermon, all the way down to the Dead Sea, down to the Salt Sea, Joshua read. It's the Dead Sea. We swim in the Dead Sea. It's so salty, man. It's so minerals that you, you, you can't go on. I mean, you bob, right? It just holds you up. And so, so it goes from up high in Mount Hermon down to the Dead Sea. The, the lowest point on earth is the Dead Sea. Huge change in elevation. And, and what happens is all this snow on top of Mount Hermon, when it melts in the spring, it comes obviously into the river and it floods the valleys. And they're in the plains of Moab. And so when that happened back during Joshua's day, that river would go from being 100 feet wide to being like a mile wide, the footprint. It was like a mile across, and it would flood. It would much deeper, and it would flood all the banks and all the fields, and it would have all these thickets that it would flood. And so it would make it almost impossible for one man who was well-trained in swimming, it'd make it almost impossible for a Navy SEAL to get across that thing. One, let alone over 2 million people estimated is what was in Israel's population at this time. You're going to get 2 million people and all their possessions across a mile-wide raging river. It's like, oh, man, that's impossible. And that's when God says, Joshua, chapter 3, verse 7, today I'm going to exalt you. I've got you exactly where I want you. This is going to be a defining moment in your life. I'm going to endear you to the people. They're going to know, as I was with Moses, I am with you. And in doing that, God teaches us some incredible things about taking the land, taking the land. And, and, and here's the thing, church, we, the church is ripe right now for taking new land. We are in a dark, dark time, and it's getting darker, and it's our time to shine, and we need to be taking new land. And here we see some incredible principles for taking that land. First, when we look at this, uh, here's the first principle that I want to uh, call your attention is if we're going to take new land, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. Now, in Joshua, they didn't know Jesus yet. Uh, Joshua, his actual, his name uh, is the Hebrew version of the Greek Jesus. It's Yeshua, and Jesus is the Greek version, so it means salvation, our God saves, right? And so, but they didn't know Jesus yet. They looked forward to the Messiah, where we look back and know that it was Jesus. But, so they would say, keep your eyes on God. I, I, today, we say, if you want to take new land, you keep your eyes on Jesus. Now, 
Remember, here's what happened. They get on the banks, and Joshua sends two spies over into Jericho. We talked about it last week. He sends these two spies over into Jericho, and man, they come back from the recon mission, and they give Joshua this absolute incredible report, a much, very much unlike the Kadesh Barnea debacle that happened where they come back and they were afraid. They come back and they say, oh, Joshua, you won't believe it, man. These fierce warriors over there, they have the heebie-jeebies, man, right now. I mean, they know we're here, and they have heard all that God has done. They heard how he parted the Red Sea. They heard how he's destroyed our enemies, how he's leading us, how, how all these things. They've heard, Joshua, and they are shaking. Their spirit is taken, it says. They don't have the spirit to fight. And this good news, and so Joshua, he packs up camp. Remember, this is about two million people strong. He packs up camp, and he moves up river a few miles, and he parks for three days. Then you think, why is he parking for three days? I mean, they've been on the banks of the river. Why is he parking here for three days? And is it so that they're getting ready to go into warrior, into battle, and he's wanting his, 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 his soldiers, his warriors to, to, to come in? And, and let, 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 me have, let me give them some three days r and R. I I mean, man, they can, they can sit on the banks and have picnics on the bank at, sun, at sunset with their wife before we go into battle. Man, they've been r and R for a while, right? I don't think that's what it was. Here, here's why I think that Joshua led his men and then had them park for three days. I think it very possibly could have been this. I think they parked right on the bank for three days because he wanted his men and his women to look at that river and realize that before uh, we, got, we face those, uh, those warriors, we've got to get across this river, and there is no way we can get across this river. There's no way that we can get, let alone get our families across, there is no way we can get across this river. Right, I, I think uh, I think that is exactly uh, uh, why God parted there. And so Joshua uh, said, basically, God has us here because we're going to learn something. When you see God get us across this river, when you see God get us across this river, then you're never going to question again. When you're face to face with that Canaanite warrior, and he's much bigger, and he's much stronger, and he's much more seasoned than you, and you think, there's no way I can beat him, you remember this river and how God got you across, and you'll never again fear that Canaanite because you'll know your God fights for you. That's teaching you something. And so the Ark of the Covenant is mentioned 17 times in these two chapters. I think nine times alone in, in chapter three, 17 and three and four, and so the Ark of, Co- Ark of the Covenant is the most important part of this story. Now, what was the Ark of the Covenant? Well, the Ark of the Covenant was this, this uh, you, you've seen Raiders Lost Ark, right? It, it, you, you read, hopefully you've read about it in the Bible or seen it in Raiders Lost it, it, it was this chest that was overlaid in gold and it was about oh, almost four foot, three, three, three and three fourths foot long and just a little over two foot high and two foot wide. It was overlaid in gold. It had two angels, cherubim, two angels on top of it and it had, had these uh, uh, places where you could put poles in the side so the priest could carry it and it would become uh, in the Holy of Holies, it was the mercy seat, the Holy of Holies in the temple. It was a symbol of God's presence with the people. It contained three things. It contained the staff of Aaron. Aaron was Moses' brother, where the priestly line comes from. It contained his staff. It contained a jar of manna. Manna is what they've been eating for 40 years. It was provided by God every morning. Uh, they would collect manna enough for one day. And they, it contained the jar of manna, Aaron's staff, and the two stone tablets upon which were written the Ten Commandments. It was in this Ark of the Covenant. And, and it was a symbol. It was a symbol of God's presence would go before the people, and he, he would fight for the people. And so, so we come in, and here's what Joshua says. Joshua says, when you see the ark, God's presence, when you see the ark go out, then you follow it, but you stay 2,000 cubits behind it. Now, why 2,000 cubits? 2,000 cubits is 1,000 yards, by the way. It's about a half a mile. Why stay behind it? Well, they set up protocols. God set up protocols in, in the Old Testament for how they should treat the ark. It was a symbol of God's presence among his people. God is holy. His people were not. His people are not holy, right? Uh, God's holy. He's pure. His people are not. Jesus had not yet atoned for the sin of the people. The atoning work of Christ had not yet atoned for the sin. That's what all the animal sacrifices represented. And so so because they were uh, not holy and God's not holy and Jesus had not yet atoned for their sin, you got to keep your distance, right? That's to respect the holiness of God. Now, 
Jesus has now atoned for, for our, our sin. Praise God, he now lives within us. Uh, I mean, it's, it's amazing. So, so they set up these protocols for how to approach the throne uh, or, or the, uh, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant and all that. And so he told them to stay back, but it wasn't just because of the holiness of God, I don't think. Why? Because he gives us a clue. He said, stay back so you'll know where to go because you've never been this way before. In other words, when the Ark of the Covenant heads out, you stay back, there's two million of you, don't get right up on it, or most of you won't be able to see it. Stay back so that you can see where the Ark of the Covenant's going, and when you see it, you follow. Keep your eyes on the Ark, and, and, and you follow exactly where it goes. So here's the point, I think, that, that we can glean from this. Those Israelites had been on the banks of the Jordan for three days, and they had been sitting on the banks of the Jordan for three days, peering at that river, knowing we gotta get across this. It's a mile wide, it's raging, it's deep. I've got my wife, I've got my kids, I've got my possessions, there's two million of us. No way, not gonna happen. And so what did, what did Joshua say? He says, you keep your eye on the ark and you, you keep your eye on Jesus. You go where Jesus goes. You, take your eye, you keep your eye on the river and you're gonna be defeated. But you keep your eye on Jesus and you watch him walk right through the river. He'll lead you right through the middle of it. Keep your eye on Jesus. It's such an important lesson for us. Because you see, we live in a wicked world. We live in a world that's degrading. We live in a world that is absolutely, just, I mean, just coming apart at the seams. And it, we look at it and we think, there is no way. I mean, Christianity, uh, you know, the heyday of, of ch uh, you know, church growth and Christian, uh, man, we know that today the number of Christians in America is going down, and, and we're thinking, what in the world, what can we do? There's just no way. This, the liberal culture, what, what, what can we do? And Joshua looks at us and says, hey, don't you keep your eye on the liberal culture. You keep your eye on Jesus and watch him go right through the middle of it. Some of you, you got a marriage, and you think there is zero way this marriage is going to make it. It is in the garbage. It's in the toilet, and it's circling bad, and I don't know what to do. There's no way God's going to save my marriage. And he says, you keep your eye off of that. You keep your eye on Jesus, and he'll walk right through the middle of it. There's no way my kids, I don't know what my kids are going to do. I don't know how my kids are going to survive in this world because I've got five kids, and I've got three kids still at home. I've got teenagers. I've got grandkids now. I've got three grandkids. And when I look at those grandkids, I'm thinking, oh, man, the world that they got to grow up in, the world, I'm like, oh, Lord, what's going on? And I keep your eye on Jesus and watch him walk them right through the middle of it. You see, there's going to be a lot of things in your life that you say, there is no way. And if you keep your eye on Jesus, you can watch Jesus turn your no way into a highway. That's what God does. And here's what Joshua, here's what we learned from this, man. What we learn is that if God can part the Red Sea, if he can part the Jordan River, if he can bring Lazarus back from the dead, if he can raise Jesus from the dead, then he can take care of whatever stands in your way and take a new land. Folks, God wants to use the church today. He wants to use the church to take new land for his kingdom. He wants to do great things in you and through you uh, to reach this kingdom, but it's gonna require keeping your eye on Jesus. I said a moment ago, man, God may be calling some of you to go to God. He's not calling all of you, but he might be calling some of you. You think there's no way you keep your eye on Jesus and watch. There's no way you can do that. You keep your eye on Jesus. The second thing we learn from this is after keeping your eye on Jesus, uh, you prepare your heart for battle. Prepare your heart for battle. He, he, here's what uh, Joshua told the people. Consecrate yourself for tomorrow, God's gonna work wonders in your, in your eyes. He's gonna work wonders. Now, what does consecrate mean? Consecrate yourself. What does that mean? Well, it means to be set aside, to be set apart, uh, set apart for holy use. Uh, you, you got a Bible on the front of your Bible. Most Bibles say the Holy Bible or Holy Bible. Why is it called holy? Because it is set apart firmly for God's use, right? So being consecrated means being set apart, means being holy, set apart for holy purposes, for God's purposes, for God's use, right? And so for Israel, here's what that typically meant. When they would consecrate themselves, they would do a few things. One, they would wash their clothes. They would wash their clothes as a symbol of purity. Now, you can imagine these Israelites, they're on the Jordan. It's at flood stage. It's raging. So where did they probably wash their clothes? In the river, and it probably wasn't clear. It was probably muddy, but they washed their clothes not to get them all clean, but as a symbol of clean, as a symbol of purity. Our lives should be pure. They, 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 then they fasted from food and sex for a short period of time. Those are needs. What was that for? Well, it was only for a short period of time because you need food. And, and, and it's saying this, when you fast, I don't know if you fasted or not, but man, I fasted. And when I fast, it's like, man, there's, there's, there's points when, man, I, I, you, you can eat a donkey, right? I mean, you'd eat a mule. I mean, it doesn't matter. If it's, man, I need me some food. 
And it's in those moments where you say, God, I need, I need something right now. I need some food, but more than I need food, I need you. It's, it's a symbol of, out of all my needs, God, you are the thing I need more than anything. So set yourself aside. You're, you got to realize as a believer in Jesus Christ, when God saved you, it wasn't about you just, just missing, heaven, missing hell and go, getting to go to heaven. That wasn't why God saved you. That's a byproduct. He saved you and you are set aside. You are set aside. You are to be holy unto the Lord. Be holy as I am holy, right? And, and, and to prepare yourself for battle. Why? Because here's, here's the thing. God, when he, when he looks for people to take new land, when he looks for people to work through, He's not looking for cultural Christians, folks. You know, a cultural Christian, we use that term. A cultural Christian is someone who claims Jesus. I'm a Christian. Man, they come to church when it's convenient. But, but listen, they, they, their lives don't really show any change. They don't, they don't think any different about sex. They don't think any different about their money. They don't think any different about parenting. They don't think any, anything different. Sin doesn't really break their heart. Uh, they don't really think any different about anything, right? It's a cultural Christian in name only. Uh, God is not looking for people who play religious games, folks. God's not looking for perfect people because there is no such thing, but he's also not looking for half-hearted people. He's looking for people who are devoted to him. Set aside. Christian, here's what I would ask you. Are you preparing? Are you preparing? You know why some of us don't, we come to worship and sometimes it's like, man, we leave and we come in and we leave the same way. We never got, maybe sometimes it's because we don't prepare for worship. Prepare, get your mind right. I'm going in to worship the almighty God, the God of the universe prepared. I think some of us, we, we, we don't see God doing things in the normal activities of daily life because we're not prepared. We're not prepared. How do we prepare? Then we prepare with Bible study. Are you studying your word? We, we've got a daily Bible reading plan. It's one chapter of the New Testament a day. It's one chapter. Uh, and, and, and you read that one chapter. Studies have revealed that the number one ingredient that for spiritual growth in the lives of people is Bible study, personal commitment to daily Bible study. Are you studying the Bible? We've got a reading plan, and you, if you read one chapter a day and you're memorizing the Sermon on the Mount, which is obviously a beautiful sermon, greatest sermon ever preached because it's preached by Jesus, uh, memorize that. Uh, it's, it's there. Are, are you doing it? Man, it's the word of God. You can't avoid that if you're a Christian. You can't neglect that if you're a Christian. I know that you miss a day or two, I, but, but you can't, that's gotta be a, 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 an important part of your life. Are, are, are you studying the word? Are you spending time in prayer? Are, are you committed to the gathering like this? And I know you say, well, you're preaching to the choir. We're all here, aren't we? Uh, but are, are you here consistently? Are you engaged consistently? Uh, are, you, are you in a D group that, that where people are helping you grow to become like Jesus? Are you preparing? Are you preparing to pr- to proclaim the gospel. We talked about that uh, in, our, in our reset series. Are you preparing to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ? I'm, I'm an in, in, introvert. I can't, are you preparing to do that? Because it's not a matter of your personality or your gifting. It's a command for all believers, right? You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. In, in, uh, in, in Matthew, he says, that, go and make disciples of all nations. It's a command for all believers. Are you preparing? Are you preparing? yourself? Are you preparing to, 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 uh, to literally be used by God? Are you preparing to serve? Prepare your heart. Prepare your heart for battle. You see, the first thing we got to do, folks, if we want to be used by God to take new land, is, is we, 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 have to, uh, we have to prepare our hearts for battle. But before we do that, we have to keep our eyes on Jesus, prepare for battle. And third, let me give you the third, is submit your life to God's authority for God's glory. Submit your life to God's authority for God's glory. Tell you what I mean. Let me try to help you understand what I mean. Joshua, think about what just happened to Joshua. Joshua has just been told by God, today I'm going to exalt you before the people. I'm going to endear you to the people. You're my chosen leader. I want people to know that as I was with Moses, I am with you. Think about what Joshua could have done. This is a defining moment. This is something big. He could have went to the people and he could have said, wow, I, I, people, God just told me he's going to exalt me before you today, right? That'd be tempting, but that's not what he did. Why? Because he wasn't interested in his glory. He was interested in God's glory. It wasn't about him. It was about God, right? Think about what God's getting ready to do. He's getting ready to win one of the greatest conquests in history. 
I mean, he's getting ready to take a group of nomadic children of slaves and defeat all of these uh, squatters on the land that God promised, and he's gonna run them fierce warriors, run these fierce warriors out of town with a group of nomadic uh, kids of slaves, slave kids. That's what he's gonna do. He, he's gonna do this, and, and he's gonna lead, use Joshua to do it. Joshua's thinking, man, you know, p- political leaders today, what are they thinking at, at, at this point? I mean, sometimes they're thinking, man, what's the kickbacks? What's the political uh, gain I can get from this? You know, what's the, my speaking engagements? What's the, you know, sometimes, I mean, that's what people do. In, in, in it. That's only what Joshua was thinking. He wasn't thinking about his clout. He wasn't thinking about kickbacks. He wasn't, what was he thinking about? God's glory. He was submitted to God's authority for God's glory. That's what Joshua was thinking about. Now, think about the priests. Think about the priests. I mean, the priests, here's what Joshua told the priests to do. Joshua said, okay, now you've been sitting here looking at this river. It's raging. We can't get across it. Here's what you do. Put, pick up the ark. You put it on your shoulders with the poles like, like, like you know, uh, uh, they did. And they, he told the priest, he said, you go and you step into the water. And as soon as you step into the water, Here's what's going to happen. God is going to shut the water down. The river's going to stop flowing, and our people's going to walk across. Now, you think about what those priests thought. You think about, think for just a moment about what Joshua just told them. You think they said, oh, sure, that's cool. Let's go. Do. No, they're thinking, this guy's found him some funny mushrooms over in the desert somewhere. I mean, he's drinking something made out of some mushrooms. I don't know what it is. Put our feet in the water? Are you kidding me? This is a raging river. We've got the ark. If he don't care about us, surely he cares about the ark. We're gonna lose it. We're all gonna be swept away. That's what they're thinking, right? I mean, they're thinking, Joshua, why in the world did this guy bring us here at this time? I mean, this is flood season. We could have come a couple of months ago. We could have come a couple of months from now, but he brought us in the middle. It's the worst time ever. Let me ask you something. Everything that's hit you right in the mouth, has it ever been on, uh, good timing? I mean, have you ever walked away after losing your job and said, well, I lost my job today, honey, but wow, that's good timing. I mean, you know, I, I, anything like that. Have you ever had a child just go off the, you know, off the rails and you go, well, baby, our child just went off the rails. <laughs> that's good timing. You know, I mean, you find out your marriage is, I mean, something's blown up in your marriage. That's great timing. nothing ever hits you at a good time, right? Nothing. God's teaching us something. And so these priests, they're thinking, this guy is crazy, doesn't make sense at all. It's not logical. I don't know what he's talking about. They could have have thought that, but then you know what they did? God said it. Joshua has given us the word of the Lord. We're going to do it. They submitted themselves to God's authority for the glory of God. They, they, they took one step, and when they stepped into the water, as soon as the water trickled between their toes, God turned the spigot off. I mean, the waters quit, quit flowing, and they piled up in a heap 19 miles upstream in a city called Adam, it says. Now, that's significant because, see, this has happened since then. This has happened in recent history. Well, in, in the last century, this has happened like three or four times that the water here at the Jordan has dammed up right here. Why? Uh, earthquakes. And so people have said, well, that was just coincidence. It was an earthquake. Yeah, the Red Sea was a coincidence. It was a coincidence that it was a coincidence, wasn't it? That the moment that the priest put his foot in the water, the earthquake. If that, if, I don't know. God may have not used an earthquake, but it, it, he could have used an earthquake, but it would have been his coincidence that the moment the, the, pre, the priest put their foot in, it happened, right? And here's the miracle of all miracles, too. Not that the water just stopped, but I mean, this water has been raging at flood stage. So what's the ground? It's going to be pure mud. Wrong. It was bone dry. Bone dry. And, and here's what happened. So the priest put his foot in the ground, uh, on the water. It immediately dammed up 19 miles upstream and every Israelite. And when it dams up, by the way, uh, it, it dams up when the earthquakes for about anywhere from 15 to 20 some hours. Now, now, now here's the thing. Uh, 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 I, when, when the people went over the river, it wasn't a family. It wasn't 50, it wasn't 100, 2 million people. 2 million people started going across this river and it was bone dry, them and all their possessions. And get this, when the last Israelite stepped foot, listen, the river started 
Do you think it's coincidence? I don't know whether God used an earthquake. God could do anything he wanted. He could have just said, stop, and it stops, because he's in charge, right? I mean, that's what God could have done. That's what he said. Stop, and it stops. God's in charge. I don't know what he used. It is no coincidence. It's not natural disaster. It's not earthquake. It's God. God stopped the river, and they all went across on dry ground. They all went across on dry ground. See, the priest, I mean, I mean, man, they, they could have, they could have said, what in the world? What in the world is going on here? God said it. I'm going to do it. God said it. I'm going to do it. Joshua said, listen, God is in control. He told them here, all those gods of all those Canaanites that were going, see, they all had, the different tribes had different gods. And he said, all these gods, you just need to know they're wood and they're stone and they're nothing. They, they don't literally exist. You know that they're nothing, right? But your God is the one true God. Your God is the creator of everything. He owns everything. He's in charge of everything. He's in charge of every drop of water and he'll stop it if he wants to stop it. He's in charge of every atom in the air. He's in charge of every cell in your body. He can do what he wants and every cell obeys him. When you see what God does, you're never going to question that. And as soon as the last Israel got, uh, got across, he, 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 here's the point. And most things that God tells us to do in his word, they seem crazy. They really do. They seem archaic. They seem outdated. Way different than what the world tells us to do, right? Think about the world's sexual ethic. It's anything goes. God says, no, it's one man, one woman. One man, one woman. One man, one woman in the context of, in, in, within the confines of marriage. That, 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 that's the sexual ethic. One man, one woman in, in marriage. Archaic. Some of you right now, you're single and you're like, that's archaic. That sounds crazy. Are you going to submit yourself to God's authority for God's glory? Same thing with money, right? I mean, God says tithe. Are you going to submit yourself to God's authority for God's glory? Some of you, listen, you, you haven't spoken to a family member in years. Man, maybe your dad beat you. Maybe you're, maybe, you know, it was a horrible experience with your parent or, or, or an uncle or, a, or, or maybe it's a brother, sister. You, you've got a bad relationship, a friend. You haven't spoken to those people for years. And here's what God says, forgive. How many times, Lord? Seven times? I'll be good. If I... No, seven times 70, meaning unlimited, basically. That was a meaning for unlimited. Forgive. God says, forgive. You think, that's crazy. You don't know what he did to me. You don't know what she did to me. I know what God does. But I do know this. I don't know what he did to you, but I know what you did to God. I know how, I know how my life rebelled against God. I know how I spit in God's face, and I know how God forgave me. That's what I know. I know I am uh, uh, in need of much grace, and therefore I should extend much grace. Because, oh, Pat, but if I forgive them, they're going to get away with it. No, they're not, because God's in control of justice. Either Jesus has already paid for their sin on the cross or they will forever in a real place called hell. You don't have to worry about justice. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, right? So they're not getting away with anything. Oh, yeah, but Pat, if I, I, I mean, I, I don't want to hang out with them. You don't have to hang out with them. You don't have to do that. Listen, I've had people that wounded me deeply. And, and sometimes, I'm just going to be honest with you, it took a while for me to forgive them. I mean, it, uh, you know, to be honest, there's sometimes I don't want to forgive people either, right? God tells me to, but I don't want to. And it's taken me a while to forgive people. But here's, here's what it was hurting. You know, it was hurting me. I was getting bitter. It was, a, it was an anchor that was dragging me down. It was keeping me from moving forward. It, it wasn't hurting them. They don't care they hurt me. They, they, could care. they didn't lose any sleep about hurting me at night, but I was because I was holding on to it. That's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness says I'm releasing them. I'm not wishing them any harm, but I don't have to hang out with them, right? I mean, I, I can forgive somebody, but I ain't going to, Longhorn with them on Friday night. I'll promise you, right? Reconciliation can only happen if there's repentance. That's what reconciliation, it can only happen if there's repentance. Are you going to forgive? Are you going to submit yourself to God's authority for God's glory? Even in marriage, you know, I mean, listen, he, he, right now, some of you found out your spouse has been unfaithful. I, I, man, we talk to people every week. Some of you found out your spouse has been unfaithful. And, and you know, here, let, me, let me tell you, memorizing, let's go back. I'm memorizing uh, uh, right now the Sermon on the Mount. And here's what 
Jesus says about divorce, the sermon on that. He says, you've heard it said of old, if you, anyone who divorces his wife needs to give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for marital unfaithfulness causes her to commit adultery, and he who marries a divorced woman commits adultery himself. So but basically, he, God loves marriage. He hates divorce, and so here's what God says, right? He, he, he says, he gives, that man, God, God hates divorce, but he gives a couple of reasons where divorce is permissible. One is sexual immorality. In other words, if it, God says that if you're married to a man and, or to a woman and he or she uh, is unfaithful to you, there, there's permissible divorce right there for you, right? That's what God says. But God didn't say to do that. Matter of fact, he said it's permissible, but he didn't tell you to do it. Matter of fact, if that person who was the offender confesses and repents, and I'm trying to be like Jesus, then what would Jesus do? What does Jesus do when you confess and repent? He forgives you. There's reconciliation, right? But now let me make sure you understand, there has to be true confession and true repentance for that reconciliation to happen, okay? Without true confession and true repentance, you can't even be right with God. So true confession and true repentance, then reconciliation can happen. So are we going to, when it comes to our sexual ethic, to our money, to our relationships, to our parenting, uh, are, are, we, are we going to say, I'm going to submit my life to God's authority for God's glory? That is when God will use you for great things. That's when God can come in and say, okay, I can use your heart because your life's not just about your career. Your life's not just about your kids. Your life's just not just about your pleasure. Your life's about my glory. And when your life's about God's glory, all your pleasure then, rather than terminating on itself, which means that's idolatry because you're worshiping pleasure, then it terminates on God. And that pleasure is a means to bring God glory and it's blessed. Then your money is an idolatry if it ends on money. But when you use your money and when you not just give, but when you use your money to bless your family and to bless others, all that, then, then that money is not an end in itself. It's not an idol. It is a means to which you bring glory to God and it's blessed. It's the same with your marriage. When your children Man, when, when your children are, are, are not about, man, I want them to, to, to be the greatest superstar at, at sports or, or this or this, but man, if they are great, but I want my children to run hard after the heart of God, and then God's glory is the end, then that's blessed. You want to be used to take land and to see God do great things through you? You got to keep your eye on Jesus, because you look at the world and you say, there's no way. You, you've got to prepare your hearts for battle, and, and, and you've got to Submit your life to God's authority for God's glory. And finally, you've got to teach your children the things of God. Uh, Joshua read chapter three. Let me read one through seven of chapter four and look at what happens. Getting across the river wasn't the end of the story. Look at what happens here. When all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people, from each tribe, a man, and command them saying, Take 12 stones from here out of the midst of the Jordan from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly and bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the 12 men from the people of Israel at whom he had appointed a man from each tribe. And Joshua said to them, pass on before the ark of the Lord, your God, your God, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan and take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time uh, to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off so these stones shall be to the people of Israel, a memorial forever. Listen, folks, here's what you're thinking. Here's what I would think. Man, we've been wondering for 40 years. We find out that after the recon mission that these people don't even have the spirit to fight. Their hearts are broken. They don't want to fight. They, they're scared to death of us. And they've got spies up in these hills. And they've got spies, and they're watching our every move because they're afraid. And they just saw what happened. They just, they were sitting over on the other side going, well, I mean, we got a little time because there's no way they're going to get across this river. We thought the same thing. And then all of a sudden, uh, when they saw the waters disappearing and, and begin to recede and, it, and the ground was bone dry and two million people walk across on dry ground, now they are done. 
man, they're not wanting to fight. They're running for the hills. They're probably running back to town right now saying, we got to go. They're coming and they're scared. And so right now, it's not the time to sit back. I mean, right now is the time to go. Let's go. I mean, let's go to battle, right? That's strategically, they're hard, they have no confidence. They don't have the spirit to fight. Let's go. But God said, oh, oh, that's important. But what's much more important to you than that battle is a spiritual battle within you. And I want to teach you something spiritual. That's what's most important. And so he said, right now, here's what I want you to do, Joshua. I want you to, I want you to send one man from each tribe down into the riverbed, and I want you to get a stone, and I want you to stack those stones up right up here where, we're going, where you're going to camp tonight. Because when you stack those stones up and your children walk by in future generations, they're going to look at those stones, and they're going to know those stones didn't just naturally uh, land in that order. And so your children's going to say, hey, Daddy, why is these stones right here? And you got the opportunity to say, well, son, let me tell you why those stones are right there. Let me tell you what my God did and why we worship him and why you should worship him and give your all for him. You see, God was telling them, I'm getting ready to give you the land, and you need to make sure you pour this into your kids. Pour it into your kids. Fill your kids' heads with the knowledge of God so that their hearts will be full of the passion for the glory of God. Teach your children. You know what's sad? Over half the churches, we baptize like three people today, right? Uh, and I'm, I, I'm grateful. I don't take it for granted. I thank God for it, every one we baptize. Because over half the churches in America last year never baptized one person not even the child of a family in the church. That's, that's like, are you kidding me? I mean, it's called biological growth. We want to reach the community, but man, we certainly want to, uh, our children within the families of our church to, to hear the gospel at church and to hear the gospel at home and come to know the Lord and baptize the children of our, of our church, surely. Not over half the church is not one. That's sad, and and. and do you know what I think is the greatest threat to that? The greatest threat to the extinction? The greatest, God, the Christianity is going to be fine. The church is going to be fine. It might move on from America just like it did from Europe. Remember, 100 years ago, Europe was the center of Christianity, right? I mean, uh, uh, and, and it's moved on. And it might move on from America. That's up to God. Christianity's fine. But it just might move on from America if a generation of people let it if a generation of people uh, become negligent. And here's the greatest threat. I don't think the greatest threat to our kids is the cultural wars that we see played out the, the, in front of us right now. I don't think that's the greatest threat at all. I don't think the greatest threat is all the liberal culture and what the, the toxic philosophies that are bombarding your kids, as toxic as it is. I don't think that's the greatest threat. Here's what I think the greatest threat is and one of the greatest strategies of the enemy is to get parents to neglect to teach their kids the word of God. That's what I really believe. I really believe that, that that's, the, that's the greatest strategy. It's to get parents to desire for their children to be better athletes than they are to be better believers in Jesus Christ or better dancers or, or better whatever. Guys, I, there's nothing wrong with wanting your kid. Please don't hear me say that. I, I mean, I, it, it, don't hear me say, there's nothing wrong. My, I love athletics. You know that. I think athletics teach huge important lessons, right? I used to be one. Now I can't run from the, uh, you know, front of the church back here. And my knee's hurting now. I'm running up here. I don't know if you see me limping. I'm like, gosh, I run from up there, up here. My knee's hurting, out of breath. I love athletics. I've got a son that played football, even played in college, and I love it. But here's the problem. When, when, when I want my kid, when, I, when my desires for my kid are more for him to be a great baseball player or a great football player or for my daughter to be a great dancer or for my child to be a great musician or singer or whatever, which is all great things, or, 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 or to make better grades, when, when, when that's the desires for my kids to be those things are greater than for my desires to love my kids to love the Lord, folks, I'm in for trouble. I, I want to teach them, great, if you're an athlete, be an athlete. Be the best you can be for the glory of God. Do all things as if you were doing them for the, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God, right? So if you're going to be an athlete, do it, give it your all. 
for the glory of God, not for your glory, not for your scholarship, uh, not, not for people who say, oh man, you, you, you hit 500. Who cares if your kid grows up and, and bats 500 in high school, gets a college scholarship, even goes to the, to the majors or to the minors? Uh, who cares if they lose their soul? Who cares if they play college football in the NFL? Who cares if they're the greatest drummer in the world? Who cares if, if they study and have good grades and become world-renowned physician, but they go to hell because they don't know the things of God? Who cares? I want them to be all those things, folks. I hope all these children up here become all those things for the glory of God. For the glory of God. God, the church, we gotta teach our kids we got to pour into our kids. I know you're saying, oh, Pat, I, it's so hard. I know it's hard. That's why you gotta, you got to be a warrior. Folks, ain't nothing comes without a fight. Not in this broken world. Our world's broken, and I don't know if you know it or not, but America didn't become a country just because it was given to us and the, and the British just let us go. We had to fight for it, right? People had to fight for it. I mean, we've had to fight ever since, and we will continue because we live in a broken world. Nothing in a broken world comes without a fight, and your kids uh, loving Jesus won't come if you sit on the sidelines and do nothing. Matter of fact, God will not be able to do much through you for great things if you just sit on the sidelines and do nothing. I know it might be tough, but we give you resources. We will help you. And if it's nothing more than sitting down and saying, hey, let me, you know, let, let me pray with you. God, help my son to love you. Amen. If it's nothing more than reading a Bible verse and praying, that, start there. We got resources. Look on our, our, our website. And listen, it doesn't take, you, you, can't, you can't, it's not like you got to sit down and take 30 to 45 minutes to do this either. I, you, you got teenagers, man, they play PlayStation. Their attention spans are, are you try to do that, you've lost them, right? I mean, I'm nothing but a big teenager. I mean, I've got ADD. I, I, Amy tells me, you, you see it every Sunday up here. I start talking about something that I'm talking about over here, and I'm thinking, what are I talking about over here? And, I, I mean, imagine being married to me. Amy starts telling me something, and right in the middle of her telling me something, man, I'll start doing this, or I'll start talking to someone over here, and she's like, you just sit right in the middle of me telling you something. I said, baby, I can do two or three things at once. I, I can hear you. Keep on. But my mind's just bam, bam, bam. You know, that's teenagers. You, you, you know, kids, man, you do this with kids more than 20 minutes. You're, you're asking for trouble, Right? You just, you, you, you do it. The, the other day, let me give you an example of, uh, of how it's, it's, the, my, 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 my daughter, my Ethiopian daughter turned 15, out of Cape. She turned 15 the other day. Uh, and so, man, I got, got Jaden is going to turn 16 next month. Uh, Isaiah turned uh, 14 in, in November. I mean, I've got them like all crunched up together. And, my, and my, my daughters, I don't know if you know this, my daughters are beautiful and I'll kill you guys, Okay. I'm just telling you, they're getting to be teenagers, and they're beautiful. Uh, and, uh, but the other day when Allie Kate, she turned 15, was in there, and so we sit down, and I said, Allie Kate? I said, we, we were just talking, and, I, but, you know, as we're celebrating her birthday. I said, what, what city were you born in in, in, in Ethiopia? Because we want them to know all their, you know, all their heritage. We want them to know that. What city were you born in in Ethiopia? What language did they speak? And all this kind of stuff. Jaden, what city were you born in in, in China? Uh, Isaiah, what city were you born in in China? And, and all this stuff. And they said, you know, they started talking about that. And I said, you were born on this day 15 years ago, Ali Kate, in Mekele, Ethiopia, by the plan of God. But let me tell you what else was God's plan. It was God's plan. Let me read to you Acts 17. Acts 17 begins to talk about how from one man, God created all men, and he created boundaries and times that they should live and the boundaries that they should not pass it. And I said, Allocate, here's what you need to know. Based on God's word, God planned for you to be born in Michele, Ethiopia, to the birth mom that gave you birth. But, but his plan, it wasn't not, okay, plan B, now her mom can't take care of her. So, man, I gotta find her a daddy. Oh, here's Pat and Amy. They'll be good, daddy. No, no, no. God's plan from the beginning was for you to be born to this woman in Ethiopia and then for you to be my child in Murfreesboro, Smyrna, Middle Tennessee, for you to grow up. And God set the boundaries and the times. Do you realize that, Allie Kate? You see, now Allie Kate realizes everything's on purpose. We began talking about it. And that was it. Let's pray. Let's talk about that. And let's pray. And it didn't take me long. Just capture the moment for the glory of God. Capture it. Teach your children memorials. That's a memorial. I can't, we adopted you. I wish, well, that's a memorial. That's a memorial for you to learn about the glory of God. Teach your kids what God's done. 
and, and, and we, we partner with you. Because if not, if you don't, let me tell you what's going to happen. Your kids are going to get eaten alive by the toxic philosophies of the world. Your kids, all of a sudden, one day, you'll wake up like many parents today who were cultural Christians. Cultural Christians yesterday, their kids tomorrow become atheists. Just so you know. Teach your children the things of God. But church, listen, this is a dark time, right? I mean, this is crazy times in our world, and we're thinking, it's a dark time. Listen, it's our time to shine. Embrace that. It's our time to shine. It's our time to take new land because our world is, is desperate. Our world is crazy. Our world is, is, is sad. Our world is looking for answers. And who's got them? We got them. We got the only consistent answer that you see. We got the answer. It's Jesus. It's the gospel. It's our time to shine. We, we can take much land for, for the kingdom right now, but it's gonna require keeping your eye on Jesus because you look out the world and you get intimidated. I can't do it. No, but God can. You, you sit and watch him part the river. You, you keep your eye on Jesus. Prepare your heart for battle. Are you preparing? Are you preparing? Are you studying how to, how, to, how to share the gospel? Are you preparing by studying the Bible? Are you preparing by being in a group? Are you preparing by coming to worship? Are you preparing your heart for battle? Are you submitting your life to the authority of God no matter how crazy it seems, no matter how outdated or archaic it seems? Are you submitting your life to the authority of God for the glory of God? And finally, are you teaching your kids? And so you say, man, my kids are gone. Great, we've got a bunch of kids in our preschool and children's ministry that need you to teach them. You've got grandkids, you need to be teaching them. It's never too late. Don't sit around and think, man, some of you think, oh, I've wasted time. Great, ask God to forgive you, quit beating yourself up, and then let's start doing it. Let's start fighting. Let's take land for the kingdom. Let's take much land for the kingdom. Right now, I'm going to pray, and Travis is going to come out in in a band, and we're going to give you an opportunity to respond. And here's the thing. If you don't know Jesus, we want you to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Your works are not going to get you there. Only Jesus and his righteousness. And Will you surrender your life to him? If you're online, you can text the word Jesus to 1-615-551-9800. Uh, and, and if you'll do that, we'll respond and help you know what that means in the room. Here's what we do, man. Some of our staff's gonna be standing down here in the front. I know some of you think, well, that's new. We're starting to do that. Some of you is like old-fashioned. It's like, oh, I'll bring them back an old-fashioned, uh, you know, come forward invitation, which I want you to know, come forward invitation is only old-fashioned if, if you're just relatively old because it, it only really began about 100 years ago. So, you know, it, it's not a thing that's biblical or non-biblical. It's a great thing. We tell you you can respond by going back or you can respond by coming down. But here's what I know. We want, number one, we want to develop a culture of prayer we want to develop a culture when the church is gathered that we come and we pray about what's on our mind. And so we want you to come. If you, if you, man, our staff's here, our elders, if you want to pray with one of our elders or one of our staff about your job, about your marriage, about your child, about somebody that's lost, that you're, you're, you're one that you're praying for, uh, about something that's got you depressed or stressed, we want to pray for you. Our elders love praying for our people. Uh, but also, you don't need us right? I mean, you can go straight to God. This is the great thing uh, that Jesus is your high priest. You can go to your knees straight to him. So we want to develop that culture. But also, here's what we know, man. I I, I want to, I'll have our staff standing down here. And if you want to give your life to Jesus, or if you're not going to stand for, come down forward and stand for Jesus here, when you go out that door, you're certainly not going to stand for Jesus out there. So man, we, we just, we just want to give you the opportunity. We want to give you the opportunity. You can pray where you are. That but we want to give you the opportunity. The altar's open. Some of our elders will be here. If you want to give your life to Jesus here in the room, you can come down. Or or, like I said, you're depressed about something. You're stressed about something. Man, some of you are in situations right now, you're looking out and you're saying, no way. No way. You need to pray about that. You need to keep your eye on Jesus and watch him make that no way a highway right through the middle of it. And you'll give him glory for it. Come and pray. Get on your knees. Come Come and pray with our elders. Submit your life to Jesus. You do what God has called you to do right now. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you, and we want this to be all about you. I pray that this church would be full of people who keep their eyes on you because we've got a lot of stuff that is completely impossible to do in our world. But God, nothing is impossible for you. Help us to keep our eyes on you and follow you. God, help us to prepare our hearts for battle. God, help our people to know it is going to take a fight. That's why Paul said, I fought the good fight. God, we live in a broken world and it's gonna take a fight, Lord. And I pray that we would be willing to to just spiritually fight the battle. 
Help us to prepare, prepare our hearts by knowing your word, studying your word, preaching your word, teaching your word, memorizing your word, loving your word. God, I pray that our people would submit to your authority even when it's crazy. we become like you and we'd say, I, I wanna be like Jesus. I'm gonna submit to his authority for his glory. And I pray, God, we would teach our children the things of God. Help us to teach our kids the things of God. Because, God, I fear they're going to be eaten alive. God, help our parents to know that cultural Christians today will produce atheists tomorrow. And help our, chill, help our parents to be serious about their walk. They're not going to be perfect. God, but I pray that they would be serious about their walk and their relationship with you. Right now, do something within this place. Holy Spirit, please let your presence be manifest so that you will get glory, so that Jesus will get glory. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. You can come and pray. You can come and make whatever decision uh, that you wanna make. Uh, we're grateful for you being here. Right now, let God lead you and you, just, you, you move as God leads.